Music can be unsettlingly prophetic, like a kind of seismograph, sensing the eruptions to come. At the very end of the 19th century, Europe was wriggling uneasily out of its old skin and changing into something new, more complex, and much more dangerous. At a time where all the old certainties of empire and the fixed social order were crumbling, so music was leaving home. It was abandoning tonality seemingly forever. In 1857, Wagner, Tristan and Isolde, how was it that this chord and this release was to be a picture for everything to come? Mm. Tonality was as much part of its social time as perspective was a part of the structure of painting as the hierarchical social order was of its political time. Tonality that would mean a chord like this would have to resolve and return home to a chord like this. With Tristan and Isolde, it was to be changed forever and we were to be adrift on a sea of indefinite tonality. An opera that starts floating in the air, quivering into being, reaching a point of pain and not resolving, except into a kind of uncertain release. After Tristan and Isolde, Music was to be changed forever.
It's the close of the 19th century. We're in Vienna, and as ever, decay smells sweet. From our vantage point in history, it's easy to see that Vienna was a city in terminal decline, but to the people living there, it was not so clear. It's hard to imagine also what a ferment of intellectual and artistic ideas were going on in Vienna at this time. Vienna was then, and remains to this day, the most conservative city in Europe. Indeed, Mahler said, when the end of the world comes, I shall go back to Vienna, because everything arrives there 20 years too late. The strange thing about Vienna is the more conservative it was, somehow the more ideas it produced. The worse they treated the artists, the more the artists seemed to flourish. At the same time, in the same city, the painter Klimt was at the head of the group called the Viennese Secession, so-called because it had declared its independence from the old decorative arts. And a group of talented writers, including Schnitzler, Hoffmannsthal and Altenberg, were working together in coffee houses, writing bittersweet tales chronicling the amorality and shallowness of the life they saw around them. In Vienna too, Ernst Mach and Freud were dealing with new concepts of the personality, with the concept of the unconscious, with the powerful urges of sexuality. There was a whole new way of thinking, as though the carpet was being pulled out from under the old order. The young composer Arnold Schoenberg was part of this scene. He was completely imbued with all the ideas of romanticism, but with a kind of ready-made skill and ability in form, in orchestration, in harmony, in melody, that's almost unthinkable today. It's deeply ironic that this man, who was to become the standard bearer of Austro-Germanic contemporary music, would really have liked to continue to compose traditionally. <laughs> However, Schoenberg felt himself pulled, as if by some gigantic centrifugal force towards progress. As a follower of the world that Wagner had bequeathed him, he felt that he had absolutely no option but to move forward. Almost without thinking, he'd shown how far music could go if it went away from its home of tonality. When he wrote Transfigured Night, it was put in for a competition. One of the jurors said something which actually was not a compliment, but was very shrewd. He said it was as if someone had taken the score of Tristan and Isolde while it was still wet and smudged it all over. Transfigured Night begins in the characteristic home of D minor. The home of darkness, of forests, of confusion in all the works of this period. It ends in a shimmering, transfigured D major. But in between, it goes on a harmonic journey of such tortuous complexity that the jury were not even willing to recognize 
that it was a harmonic possibility. The point in question started with these two chords. Innocuous enough. These two chords were not supposed to have existed. Now, they seem no great problem to us today, but in fact, in the whole piece, you can hear tonality stretching so much that it is actually out of shape. We begin to be lost. For composers like Schoenberg, Webern, Berg, the idea of moving away from tonality was not destroying some time-honored law, but it was a way of moving forward and it was a way of a new type of strength. Webern, talking later about this time, was very, very eloquent. He talks of the idea of once again flying away from Earth, but staying close enough to Earth, as a baby bird will, to be safe, but gradually gaining strength and power and daring. If, very simply, moving from the certainties of a chord and the certainties of a scale like C major, which seems so simple, so natural to us. We move to a world where there's not a hierarchy between tones, where there's not the home bass, the dominant, back to the home base, but where all 12 tones are equal, a kind of democratic musical order. We are then in the 20th century. Schoenberg's inspiration for Transfigured Night was a narrative poem by his contemporary Richard Demel. It's typical of its time in its fevered expressionist intensity. A woman is alone in a forest. She's pregnant. She meets her lover and tells him that she's carrying a baby which is not his. And in true romantic fashion, the tension is released in the man's acceptance of this saying that this child in your womb will become transfigured and it will become the child of our love by this miracle.
all the music we're playing in the first part of this program is to do with night. All the first part of the 19th century, the whole idea of the forest was of something spiritual, of something healing, something nurturing, where you went to refresh yourself. At some unnamed time, at the end of the 19th century, the forest becomes full of psychological dangers, of psychological fears. The night becomes a place where shadows are everywhere, where you can be possessed by the power of the unconscious. One of the loyalist supporters of Schoenberg and his radical experiments was Gustav Mahler. It's very obvious now, looking back, that Mahler is an absolutely central figure, not only to Vienna, but to all of classical music in this century. He was not only a transitional figure, he was also an enabler, an inspirer in all the art forms around him. His music is both full of a profound nostalgia for the past and an intense modernity of outlook. Mahler's Seventh Symphony, again, is a piece of the night. It's a journey through the night to a garish, provisional, dangerous day. Now, the very central movement of this, the third movement, is marked Schattenhaft, which is shadowy. And it's a nightmare. <laughs> We're somehow hearing echoes of all the music for the previous 200 years, but torn up as if through a faulty memory. This is music which has lost its balance. And although the harmony is very clear, there is the feeling that the ground is collapsing under our feet. This being Vienna, 
it's hard to know who is conservative and who is radical. And these concepts can change very rapidly. Once again, we don't know exactly where we are. When the architect Adolf Luce said, in almost a prayer, please shake us out of our complacency and comfort, he could have had nothing more apt in mind than Strauss's Electra. It is still one of the most disturbing pieces ever written. It could not have been written by a person who was a profound philosopher. It had to be written by a person who was pragmatic, who was opportunist, and who could reflect clearly what was going on around him, almost without thinking. It's a reactive piece rather than a thoughtful piece. And one of the great themes of this time was the crazy woman. Now, this is not just a misogynistic idea, but another reflection of the strength of the unconscious. In Electra, we see a psychotic, dangerous woman who wants to pull everything into herself. The image of the all-destroying, all-devouring harpy. Clytemnestra has murdered her husband, Agamemnon, who is the father of Electra. The opera is concerning Electra's revenge. When we see Clytemnestra, she is in an almost drug-crazed panic. She is having the archetypal nightmare of turn-of-the-century Vienna. But taken to an extreme and taken to a kind of close-up that is still uncomfortable to watch. Es ist keine Wort. Es ist kein Schmerz. Es drückt mich nicht. Es wird mich nicht. Strauss, in his brilliant, instinctive way, had blazed a path for a whole new school of music. Almost without thinking, 
he'd shown how far music could go if it went away from its home of tonality. Electra must have seemed very radical at the time. And maybe it was obvious to Strauss what a frightening and lonely place this outer space of free tonality was. He was never to return to it, and it was left to Arnold Schoenberg, the reluctant revolutionary, to go even further, to be even more radical, but also to give some sense of order and foundation to this strange new world. When we come to Schoenberg's five pieces for orchestra, we're in a sea of indefinite tonality. The first of them is called Premonitions, and it always gives me the feeling of being in a kind of musical haunted house in which all the images coming at you are from paintings by Egon Schiele. Already all the trademarks of the new music are there, just as in Schiele's work. The angular lines and great wide leaps, the stretchings, and the sudden feeling of obsessive repetitions. Most alarming of all, even in the time of Freud, is the sense that this music has erupted fully grown, straight from the composer's subconscious. And it's a dangerous nightmare world. Throughout the closing years of the 19th century, one of the great themes running through all the arts is a yearning for death, a yearning for oblivion. Schoenberg's remembrance is doing the same thing as Tristan and Isolde, but it's doing it from the other side of a psychological ocean. Once again, it's returning to D minor with endless yearning, but it's returning to the memory of a home which can no longer be. In this piece, I can hear Schoenberg's doubts and fears, his obsessive concern with the dark and lonely road he was following, and his regret and nostalgia for the 19th century romanticism he'd left behind. Throughout the movement, there are little expressive moments, like little shavings from the workbench of Tristan and Isolde, but repeated compulsively like a mantra. What I find particularly touching is the way that, at the end of the movement, all these things have been combined, like a kind of treasured but jumbled and torn up memory you might grasp at on the edge of sight and feeling but which has in truth already vanished forever.
Imagine an artist in the middle of the sea of all these possibilities, producing staggering art, but without the feeling of a foundation, a discipline to work in. It was left again to Schoenberg to try to find a way to replace tonality, to replace harmony, to try to find some frame in which people could work. Because in fact, the logic of complete freedom leads to the madhouse. We talked before of the idea of democracy in tones, losing the losing the seven tones of the diatonic scale and replacing them with Schoenberg realized that there had to be some way to manipulate these notes which would give an inherent structure to the piece. So if one was to take these notes at random, these 12 notes, and reorder them, for instance, so that all of the 12 notes are sounded before any other notes can be played. Immediately, there is a structure. Now, to start off with, this seemed like a very onerous burden, this tone row. But as Webern said, this wasn't a problem. It was actually salvation for them. If you take away harmony, you take away the ear's reference points. It becomes more and more difficult to write music that lasts any time at all. And to start off with, composers like Webern found that once they had played the 12 notes, what else was there to do? It was like a perfect little gem hung in the air. What else was there to do? The row I played before actually comes from the fourth of his five pieces for orchestra. This was, up to that time, still the shortest piece of classical music that had ever been written. It is exactly 19 seconds. The row is played only three times. But once again, these notes, which were... can be put together to form magical combinations. So the first 12 notes sound. And this is essentially whisper music. It's like a Japanese haiku, where there are only a certain number of syllables possible, but with which you can express profound truths. In the music of Webern, with all its simplicity, economy, and crystalline perfection, one's not only talking about the events that we hear, it's the spaces between the notes that have almost as much expression as the notes themselves. <laughs>
Alban Berg became Schoenberg's pupil in Vienna in 1904 when he was 19. It was around the same time as Weber. Both of them followed Schoenberg through all his journeys and explorations, and in every sense he was to them teacher and mentor and inspiration. In some ways, Berg's works are even more closely organised than those of Schoenberg and Weidmann. He has proved to be really the humanising force in this music. In using the 12 tone row, for instance, he wanted to find ways in which the human ear could pick up ancient echoes of harmony. <laughs> Manon Gropius, the daughter of Mahler's widow, Alma Mahler, and the architect Walter Gropius, died at a tragically early age. Berg adored her and was shattered by the news. He decided to write a violin concerto in memory of an angel. In writing the piece, Berg more than ever wanted to communicate the depth of his feeling. And to do this, he provided the 12-tone system with a romantic face. Now, choosing the order of 12 notes was always a very personal thing. And he chose these 12 notes. Now, the first thing we can hear in the notes is that it is full of common chords. And major and minor chords full of bittersweetness. And at the end, there's a little tail, which is two things. It's a tritone, three whole tones together, what was called in medieval times, Diabolus in Musica, the devil in music. But it is also the first three notes of Bach's chorale, It is enough, Lord, if it be thy will. A great memorial chorale. Mm -hmm. In the last movement, the inevitable collision of Bach and contemporary music seems at first to be a shock. But very quickly, we come to realize that in fact, this is a timeless music. And it becomes full of poignancy and wonder. This is music that stinks of the terror and anguish of its time. Berg was not only writing a requiem for a young woman that he loved dearly, but in a deeper sense, a requiem for a culture which was disappearing around him, the culture that had given him birth.
the culture had already begun to disintegrate in 1914 when Europe was engulfed by war. In 1916, the last vestiges of the old world disappeared with the death of Franz Joseph, Emperor of Austria-Hungary. By 1918, Austria-Hungary had suffered over seven million casualties. The shock wave of this cataclysm continued into the 1920s with revolution and civil unrest. anti-Semitism which had been so rife throughout Mahler's career and on had now been elevated to the status of a political system. In February 1933, just four weeks after Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, Berg went to Munich to judge a music competition. It was carnival time, and he wrote to his wife these two sentences. The whole town and all its inhabitants are quite drowned in carnival din, masks and confetti, and on top of that, the news of the Reichstag fire, dancing on a volcano. In 1938, the Austrian people willingly forfeited their independence and welcomed Adolf Hitler to Vienna. Alban Berg was dead. Arnold Schoenberg, a victim of Jewish persecution, had fled for America. Anton Webern stayed and survived the worst of the war, only to die in 1945, accidentally shot by an American soldier.